Geordie. Hello and welcome to the Big Travel Podcast. I'm Lisa Francesca Nan. Mimi I's effervescent observations about food have gained her a large online following and her new recipe book tells wonderful tales of a childhood spent between Burma and Kent. She's been shadowed by the military informer on family holidays, is conflicted by seeing people flying over pagodas in hot air balloons and loves nothing more than exploring Japanese life and food and blasting out a bit of late night karaoke. I'm delighted to have popped around to Mimi's house for a chat and I'm sure you're going to love her just as as much as I do. You do have this big online presence. You've got a big following online as a food writer. And this is a dream for many, many people. A bit like people say to me about travel writing and travel journalism. Food writing and food journalism is, is on the same part. How did you get into that? Randomly. So probably about 10 years ago, I had a blog and it was around about the time when Twitter started as well. So I had the blog. It was it was much more of a kind of old school, not doing things for influencing or anything like that. I don't even know what an influencer is, but basically kind of writing about things that amused me. So I, I started off by making fun of MasterChef. <laughs> So like the first few few posts were probably just about making fun of the people that were on MasterChef. And then after that, it was diverged into food generally. And then, as I said, Twitter was around about the same time. So I started following like-minded people and talking rubbish to them. Actually, one of the first people I followed was the guy that won MasterChef that year, mainly to tease him. Um, but it turned out he thought that it, well, he didn't mind being teased and he was actually a really good bloke. And we ended up, I ended up cooking at his restaurant. So <laughs> he, he took it in all for, this guy called Matt Follis, who won in 2009. So yeah, he took it in, in good humour. Have you thought about going on it yourself? Go oh, no, no, no. Because apart from anything else, I don't want to be the butt of someone else's jokes. Because... You'll know there's someone like you setting up exactly. on Twitter accounts specifically exactly. to have a go at you. No, no, it's just, I would never, ever want to be um, a chef. I, I, the people that I know in the restaurant industry, in the hospitality industry, I just they just seem so tired all the time. And, you know, I'm tired, but I don't want to be tired because I'm on my feet cooking for ungrateful people, which is what seems to be It's the long case. hours. It's really long hours, really isn't it? Anyone long. in restaurants and pubs. And, and I don't think they're very well paid. And I think they're, they're doing Unless it because they love the it. Top. That's, you know, that's pretty rare. That's With kind of Gordon Ramsay industries. executive chef swanning around with many many restaurants i've had giles corin on he seems to have a few quid i went around his house had a cup of tea he's got a nice big house <laughs> really? like, well, yeah. it sounds of him, he started off with a few quid yeah anyway. i'm not necessarily sure that came from the writing but you know he can dream <laughs> he must do all right out of it I, I think he does i mean he's one of the most foremost critics right he, he you know he is a household name so it's not surprising but you know it's very very there's, there's not much space at the top and I'm quite happy paddling at the bottom so. you're not quite at the bottom you're somewhere in the middle and this beautiful book which I have in my hands now which is just colourful and amazing it's called Mandalay Recipes and Tales from a Burmese Kitchen so you might as well start after you've, you've just started in fact you've, you have started already because you told us about your, uh, how you got into it you might as well secondly for seconds oh I've got it I've got it got it for seconds for the second course you might as well tell us about the Burmese connection okay so I am Burmese I was a stowaway I, my parents came to this country a few months before I was born so you know, I, I was a stowaway, and uh, did they know about you? They did. Although they didn't you went tell anyone. Clinging on underneath they, the lorry. They didn't tell anyone. My mum had this thing where, like, I think her uterus was pointing the wrong way around, so no one knew she was pregnant until she just about came back. Oh, that's interesting. So, so Would that made a, have made a difference coming into the country. I don't think so. No, I mean, I don't think so. yeah. I mean, when they came along, they, they basically they came. My the parents are both doctors, and so they came along um, to for jobs here. So they they started in Margate. Um, at the seaside Um, and yeah it it was funny because the day they arrived was Independence Day for Burma so it was quite ironic that they came to the UK on Independence Day Um, and then as I said a few few months later I was born and then my my mum and dad are kind of they're very stubborn is probably the best word for it at the time I think they had all these policies where they said basically if you were an immigrant you had to make sure that you learnt English and you had to make sure your children learnt English and one of the policies they had was that they said that you shouldn't 
speak your native tongue at home and so you know my parents were dragged into my brother's schools their brother's quite a bit older than me they're six and nine years older than me and they were told that you know you must only speak english at home and you mustn't teach you know teach your children burmese blah 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 oh my god you're going to say you don't speak the language no i do i do oh, but do, that's okay. the thing but this is what i mean about my parents being stubborn because they are they are so stubborn and also they're quite old-fashioned so they kind of did the opposite of what they were told um, and, you know, secretly taught us all. So, you know, even though I, I was born and brought up in this country, I, I speak and read Burmese. You know, I'm, I'm wearing a Burmese sarong because that's just what I'm used to. And so I'm kind of, I, is it third culture kid? Yes. Yeah, so I, I kind of feel very much like I've got a foot in both countries. Also because ever since I was eight, basically as soon as my parents could afford it, they went back to Burma. And so we would go back every other year. And so it was kind of my home from home. Did you find it difficult growing up as a Burmese person in Kent, you know, having those two or even three cultures? Hang on, where's the third? Which is the third? Oh, I don't know. This is <laughs> the, it doesn't the third culture just be your between two? Yes, that's it. Yeah. Yes, yeah. yeah, I read about that not so long ago. I'm, I feel like I'm third hybrid, culture as well. Hybrid, hybrid. Yeah, it was weird. I mean, you know, this is a very, very kind of... <laughs> it's a very white neighbourhood, let's say. And, yes, uh, Kent, uh, and, uh, you know, it's the centre of uh, UKIP and, you know... It's it got, is. It's got a lot, mean, of, lot of things going for I, it. It's beautiful. I, I, spend I still a lot of time get there, BNP but... leaflets through the door, so... Nice, <laughs> yes, uh... Yeah, it, it, it was difficult. I mean, you know, I wasn't... I wasn't quite the only brown person in the school, but it was near. There's not like a great Burmese community in Margate. No, no, there wasn't in Margate. And the other problem was that because the, basically, a lot of people got sent around around those times. And because they were all being posted, they were sent all around the country. And so kind of almost involuntarily, you would have pockets of people all over. So my mum and dad didn't stay in Margate. They went to Cardiff. They went to, um, they were in Romford for a while. Um, and then they eventually settled here where I am in Kent. So... Um, Were they fleeing Burma? Because it's been a place of great unrest, you know, for a long, long time. Sort still, of. I guess. I mean, still civil they, war happening they, in some parts. They weren't kind of officially refugees, but basically my mum likes to say that we left before your dad was stuck in prison. Um, so <laughs> um, it, it, you know, it, was a, it was a time where basically I th- it, it's still the case. If, you know, if someone that kind of is doing something that the government isn't very happy with, you're in risk of getting in trouble. So... It's the classic, we want, you know, a better life. So my my mum also likes to go on about how she had to sell all of her jewellery to come to this country. So (laughs) it's, uh, like I said, we weren't quite refugees, but we were definitely coming where we thought that we'd be safer. And, you know... You You must have been exposed to people who were involved in a a, a sort of dissidents, I guess, as they might be. Oh, yeah, completely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, know, we have friends and family members who, let's say, are probably... (laughs) keep their heads down slightly less than we do if you see what I mean so but yeah no it's always something that we were very aware of um I mean like I said ever since I was eight we would go back but whenever we went back um I was very aware of that there was um a presence of something called MI which was called the military informer so basically whenever we were there there would be someone shadowing us to make sure that we weren't trying to you know, race edition or anything that was dodgy and it was actually a, a really a family holiday rather than anything else because they were very suspicious of anyone coming from over abroad and oh, that's fascinating yeah. Some, someone would be literally following you in a car or standing yeah. in the shadows where you're yeah, yeah, like, park you, or you'd have a plain clothes person so I have a very kind of slightly conflicted relationship with them which I, <laughs> I didn't mention in the book but basically there, there was always this kind of presence that you had when you were over there which meant that you had to feel like you had to behave um, and you know, it, I still have that. So you know, whenever we go over, I <laughs> tend to go over with my mum and dad, uh, which makes me sound like a terrible coward. But it's just because I have this hangover from having always gone over and feeling that there was someone watching me. So you know, that that, I, and we're not alone. I think this is relatively common for people that had been allowed to leave the country and to come back. Basically, there were a lot of people who burnt their bridges very openly, and you know have obviously been demonstrating against government against what's happening right now and you know they're the people who you know basically on a no-fly list you can't come home so we're aware that we have to behave and it, it is it's difficult so you know I completely love being in Burma but at the same time there's that kind of uneasy feeling that you always have 
which you know if you're a tourist you're not gonna have because you're <laughs> british as well you're burmese and you're british it's that third culture thing you're, you're used to standing up for your rights and being given well equal that's the rights. thing i remember i when i used to have a burmese passport and i had it confiscated because there's no such thing as dual citizenship and so it was basically you know you have to choose and it was a real wrench to have to say okay i'm gonna have to choose british because you know this is where you know i was born this is where i've made my home um and then obviously the Burmese government was like, that's fine, well, you're not Burmese anymore, so they took my passport. So, <laughs> and you know, that's a situation that people ha- have faced. I mean, I know other countries do that, but it, it, it's a real kind of sense of loss that you have when that happens. But you've stayed very connected to your culture, to that culture, <laughs> your, one of your cultures. One of my cultures, yeah. No, I mean, like I said, it's kind of, a lot of the time I think in Burmese, um, like when I'm talking, so I, I married a, an, an English guy um, and... I've been trying to teach him and he's, you know, he, he does understand quite a lot now. We've been together for a very, very long time and we're also trying to teach the children Burmese. But every so often I will just slip into using a phrase that doesn't exist in English because the concept doesn't exist in English, if you see what I mean. So. I do, you know exactly what you mean. Yeah, so... My dad never taught me. My dad comes from Fiji, but he's an Indian Fijian, so okay. he's 100% Indian blood. Mm-hmm. And he never taught me even a word of Hindi, not even a word. So I feel a bit ridiculous, actually. And I think it would have been... Not, in fact, when we were younger, we sort of did everything to sort of ignore that part of the culture completely. We were English, and then we moved to Spain and learnt Spanish and right. learnt French oh, as well. But wow. Not even, a, not even a word of Hindi. But, I, I mean, I wonder if it's the same kind of thing, because, like I said, it was a fairly open policy where they said, do not teach your children your native language. So I wonder if he was affected by that. I don't know, actually. I'll have to ask. I think I might have asked him, because I've actually had him on the podcast, um, <laughs> which was quite an emotional sort of journey, you know, Aww. speaking to him about it all. But I'll, I'll ask him. I think he just... I think he's just quite... You know, he just doesn't look back. And a lot of Im- immigrants are like that sometimes, aren't they? they? There's a few sort of immigrant routes that people go down. One yeah. is like not assimilating at all yeah. and, you know, keeping themselves to themselves. Two is doing what, what you did, assimilating and, you know, keeping both cultures. And three is just like, you know, that's it. See you later. I'm, I'm British now. My family are British, you know. I mean, it's interesting because, you know, like I said, I'm wearing a Burmese sarong. So my mum and dad would try and keep up their Burmese clothes just because it's what they're comfortable in. But I remember that their friends, some of them would take the mic out. They would actually mock them and say, you know, why don't you wear dresses? Why don't you do this, that and the other? And my mum was like, but I don't like wearing dresses. So, you know, it, was all, it wasn't even like a, a, a deliberate patriotic thing. It was just, this is what I'm comfortable in. This is what so, I wear. This is what I wear. And it's funny because I, I think... I mean, obviously, I'm kind of half and half, and I, I realistically, I know that I would never be able to live in Burma forever because this is, you know, the UK is my home. But I think my mum and dad still think at some point they will move back, and I think they all have always thought that, even though they've been in this country longer than they've been in Burma. Um, there's part of them that just thinks, you know, when you know, when the children, the grandchildren are a bit older, they'll they'll move back, and we can go visit them there, and you know, it's not unrealistic a thought, but it, it's kind of. I think they always, in some ways, they always think, well, you know, it's it's too cold here. We want to be somewhere yeah, warm. Totally, so totally it's such practical that. reasons more than anything else. And it looks a beautiful country. I've never been. We're calling it Burma, not Myanmar. So we call it Burma just because, again, it's what we used to. Because, you know, when my parents left the country, it was Burma. Um, I think it was officially changed in sometime in the 80s. But the, the thing is, it's, it's kind of a weird name. So it, Myanmar was something that it was always called, but in literature and in formal writing. It was always pronounced Burma, even though it was written Myanmar. Um, I've been reading up on it. It comes from the same word. It's the it? same word anyway, which is why. So it, it doesn't really matter. It doesn't matter. Nobody's going to get offended. Although some people might get offended. Some people get very, <laughs> very cross with me for using Burma. And they're like, it's not Burma, it's Myanmar. And I just say, well, you know, Myanmar is actually quite hard to say, even to a Burmese, you know. And everyone we, else like says Myanmar anyway. Well, that's the thing. No one knows how to pronounce it. Everyone says it wrong anyway. Yeah. So. So, so, you know, I'm quite happy to call it Burma. Or anything. It looks like the most amazing country. I haven't been. I've, I've been to most countries so surrounding it mm-hmm. um you know including to the temples in cambodia and vietnam and it, it has that sort of beautiful history doesn't it, it has mm-hmm. that the, the temples and the landscapes and i can just i can smell it almost you know the sights and sounds well i mean it's got some kind of very i guess picturesque so like pagan is probably the place that's most famous for people outside which is the place which is literally lots and lots of temples so kind of our angkor Wat. 
and you know that's somewhere that's absolutely can they're still building temples it's like the kids temple crazy so you know they're the original ones that date from i don't know the, the, uh, just a very very long time ago my <laughs> my Burmese history is terrible but and then but they're, they're still building them but they're building them in the original style so it's not that obvious but it's like how many temples can you fit in this you know, area? so they're in that space it almost looks like cappadocia in turkey doesn't it because people go ballooning there and yeah it's got this vast landscape with temples sort of popping up see randomly is that they, the place it is the place but the thing about the balloons right so like the british part of me is like kind of oh it's beautiful and i'd love to do that but the british part of me is slightly horrified by that because because I'm, I'm i'm technically a buddhist I'm kind of like a, a very, very lazy, don't really practice Buddhist. But one of the things that you're taught as a Buddhist is that like the, the, the pagoda or the Buddha should be the highest thing in the house, um. right? So I, I've got a shrine here, as you can see my living room. So that is the highest thing in this room. And so the thought of people the flying over these pagodas makes me really itchy because I think you shouldn't yeah. really be doing that. Why do they allow it then? You know, money. Tour, tourist dollar. It's, three, it's three hundred dollars per person. Oh my word! To take a balloon. Up That's there. why they allow it. Is there anything about feet as well? Because you know, in Thailand, you've got something yeah. about the soles of your feet. You never expose anyone to the soles. Yeah, of your feet. exactly. So you don't point them at people, and it's the same thing. So you don't wear shoes. Which is actually quite difficult sometimes because, you know, I've got pathetic Western feet in a lot of ways. And, and so, you know, sometimes these places you, you've got kind of dust and rubble and all sorts of things. And you're like, what have I just stepped on? But it's lovely when you go in, say, you know, in Thailand or Cambodia or Vietnam. I'm, like I said, I've never been to Burma. but And you do kick off your shoes in a beautiful temple and you can hear the water yeah. trickling and the wind chimes it is really nice. ringing in the distance it's so atmospheric actually i'm thinking probably one of my favorite places is jim thompson's house in bangkok have you ever <laughs> been there no i know I'm, of it's, it, though. A, it's a big tourist attraction but it was his house that 100 years ago he, he was living in and he started as an american collector actually it was probably when you think about it it's quite dodgy he just went around buying stuff probably you know <laughs> pillaging and getting things and traveling and bringing them back to his house and furnishing this beautiful house but it is an oasis mm. in the city of bangkok and i always say to anyone who goes to bangkok go to jim thompson's house because it's the be- beautiful wooden pagoda style building with little water features everywhere and ponds and koi carp and the wind chimes as i said and just stunning and, and covered in antiques that he has pillaged from i'm sorry to anyone who's related to jim thompson <laughs> who by the way disappeared in the jungle one time when he was off on one of his missions uh oh wow yes and <laughs> never to be seen again but it, you know it, with all these beautiful artifacts so if you traveled a lot in the local local i say local in, in southeast Burma. asia yes, or yes. well Burma, not not not, not in southeast asia so much because because i have this thing which i always had which is i always felt guilty and that i should be in burma rather than somewhere else so you know if i was gonna like pay for a long-haul flight and take time off work or take time off school i felt like i should be with my family so i haven't actually traveled that much within southeast asia um, apart from you can't get direct flights to Burma so we would have to stop off somewhere so we might spend like a day in Singapore or in Thailand or whatever so, but that's the extent usually where I've travelled um, but within Burma itself yes we, we travelled quite a lot and it was kind of nice because like we'd hire a big pickup truck or a minibus and basically <laughs> any of my family members that was free would just come with us um, and so you know we'd go around to I'm visualising sort of summer holiday kind of yeah, yeah. Bit, you know the sort of Burmese kind of kind of and it'd be great because like you know we'd, we'd kind of stop everywhere and we'd have all like the, kind of the local villagers come and bring us food to you know to sell to us basically and it was like oh this is the speciality of this region and oh they, they have it in this place so that was that was really nice and so we go to like kind of like the, the big hotspots and you know like i said because it's a, a predominantly a buddhist country the hotspots for tourism would be buddhist kind of places so you'd get like this is a place called Jaitiyo, which is near Yangon, and it's kind of <laughs> allegedly a huge golden rock that's the shape of the Buddha's head. Don't ask. But, but it's, Can you see it? Does it look like Not the really. No, not really. But, but the, the thing With is, a bit of imagination. it's balanced on the top of a very high kind of uh, this is a hill. It's not really a mountain. But it's balanced in a very weird, precarious way. And the point is, is oh, it's really holy. There are some hairs from his head that are there, which is why it never falls. Uh, and so we'd go up there and kind of like, we'd, then, then there's this thing where if you can climb to the top of it, it'll add 10 years to your life. There's some weird kind of myth. So we'd do that. Or we'd go and see this other um, uh, big lying Buddha in Pago, which is again near Yangon, and that's like the the hugest lying Buddha in the world. And again, you know, at the time it was probably not now, but it was always kind of 
No, it wasn't a religious thing in any way. It was just a、uh, oh, fun times, and there was always traders and snacks and ice cream vendors and people selling little wooden toys and stuff made of straw, and you'd be like, oh, toys, snacks, all sorts of things. So it was just a jolly. You know, and, and and then occasionally, you know, you'd suddenly remember, oh, actually, that's a huge Buddha. Hmm. And then you just laugh. I mean, this is the thing that my mom and dad never understood about churches because churches are solemn and quiet, and you know, everyone's very, very reserved. And look,、like, pagodas basically. You just have little children running around with windmills, like throwing stuff at each other. It's just, it's a place where people congregate and chill out. And possibly pray, but that doesn't actually seem to be the kind of predominant reason for going. Oh, that's、so. a really interesting take on it. Having been into many pagodas and temples,、um, I always treat them with a certain amount of reverence. Like when I'm abroad,、oh, I, will, I will cover not up. Not the ones in Burma. <laughs> <laughs> People are just like running around having a laugh. That sounds yeah, great. Yeah, that sounds great. no, it, you know, it, it, and also because you know you were saying about how like it's kind of tranquil. It is tranquil, but the, one of the things is the pagodas. A lot of the pagodas have marble as the flooring, so actually, and also the Columns, so it's actually a really nice, cool place to stay.、Yes. So if you want to, you know, be somewhere that's nice away from the sun, you can have a nap there. And often people are just having naps in the shade of a pagoda. Oh my god,、so. I want to spend some time in a Burmese pagoda. I really do. Is, is travel important to you? Do you travel elsewhere? Okay, you, you, you feel a bit. We're actually, funny what you said, just as a side point, in、um, about feeling a bit guilty、yeah. of not going to many other Southeast Asian countries. I was talking to my friends in Spain. I was there a few weeks ago, and we had this weird conversation that I feel when I'm in Spain and not in my hometown in Spain where I grew up. I feel homesick.、Aww. Now this is this is really weird. I feel homesick for my hometown. Yeah. But this happens if I go to like. The town that's like half an hour away or a ten minute drive away. I start to bit like if I go to Ben or Madna or whatever or La Cala、uh, on the coast in Costa del Sol where I, I grew up. I get a bit homesick and it sounds weird. <laughs> and they were just laughing their heads off at me. They're like, "You have travelled the world. You're a travel professional.、Oh. You know, even when you live in London, like I've travelled an hour to come and see you today.、Yeah. We both live in South East London.、Yeah. So you know, when you're in London, you do that. That's just in the same city. Yeah. And I don't feel homesick at all. But when I'm in Spain, almost I don't know. I feel like. I, don't know, I, I think it's because it's nervous in, and sad. I think it's because it's it's just about within reach. Maybe、I、yes, because your home、yeah. is so far away and somewhere that you dream of going, and、yeah. it's just about in reach, but you're not there. Yeah, it's a weird feeling. But after about half an hour, and even in a nearby town, I'm like, okay, I want to go home now. <laughs> Anyway,、um, so have you travelled? You haven't travelled that much through Southeast Asia. No, I tell you where, where I do go a lot, though. And, and anyone that knows me online will know this is that we go to Japan a lot. My husband and I now with the kids as well. Oh, do you? Because, That's interesting. Well, because we kind of we, we like a lot of Japanese food and culture,、um, and we started going probably quite a long time ago. Two thousand and seven, I think, was the first time we went,、um, and it's just it's just something that gels with everything that we like about holidays because. You know, it's it's everything's easy and fun, and there's lots of different things to do. So if you want to go to a temple, you can go to a temple. But if you want to go to karaoke, you can go karaoke. You know what I mean? It's a like it's, a bit of karaoke. It's the best I do, but it's the best of everything. It's the best of every world.、Um, but it's also, I mean, people, I, I don't know. There is this kind of myth, I think, that Japan's expensive, but I think it's actually cheaper than London. Well, yeah, so, when you come from somewhere like London, nothing、yeah. is really that expensive. True. In, well. Yeah, kind of. Kind of. People, places are quite Scandinavia. <laughs> yes, Scandinavia. I was just thinking actually now since our pound is like hit the floor, you know things are a lot more expensive. Yeah, even、true. places like Dublin, it's really expensive. Oh, don't, don't. But um, so you take the kids to Japan. How、we、do, do they, how do they deal with that? Oh, they love it. Kids anywhere long haul, yeah. Uh, so because we started, because we didn't want to have to pay for our daughter, so before she turned two, just before she turned two, we took her to Japan for the first time, and we did the same thing with our son. And you know they really love it because I don't know, <laughs> we're quite geeky. You probably see from my home、um, that there's, there's quite a lot of kind of geeky influence, and we like Japanese films and culture and movies and comics and all sorts of things. So it's something that they've grown up with. Already, so、yeah. and the food as well as a foodie. Yeah, well, you know, I, I've never had a bad meal in Japan. I have to say, so is it? Un- I haven't been to Japan actually. Is it? Un- are there unidentifiable things like there are in China? When you think Chinese food and you get there and you're like, oh wow, <laughs> this wasn't wasn't what I was expecting. 
Occasionally. So, like, if you go to places that are kind of very old school, traditional, then you'll you'll get out. So they, they they'll come out with, I guess, the tiny appetizers. So you'll get beautiful little bowls, all different, with kind of pickles and things, and you're not entirely sure what they are, and they might not be stuff that you want to know about. So. <laughs> if I just eat it, but you eat it and it's it. delicious, and you know, it's probably some massively seasonal thing that can only come because they love the seasonal thing as well. One of the things that I love about Japan is that depending on the time of year, even their kind of trash. Like their junk food is seasonal, so like all the ice lollies when we went last time around were this type of citrus called a shakosha, which is a very I guess it's almost like a calamansi, so kind of sharper and sweeter than your normal lemon. But like the Kit Kats were that flavour and the lollies were that flavour, and you know they they have a real dedication to seasonalness. And we've been in autumn before when everything becomes like a type of particular type of pumpkin. Very so interesting. So that's really fun. It's yeah. like us having everything apple at one time of year. Yeah, exactly. But but not just apple, like a Braeburn apple. Yeah, everything. <laughs> Everything's very Braben, specific. Kit Kats, Braeburn. And I love yeah. that. It's just so, it, you know, it appeals to, like I said, the geekiness in me. So I'm like, oh, we were there. You're a bit stuffed if you don't like that one thing and you've got it for like true. four weeks or something. This Nothing is true. That's why you need to plan when you go the time of year. It's not just the weather. It's <laughs> what's on the menu. So food, I mean, food is a very important part of travelling. And I, I the countries I haven't been to because of the food oh really yeah absolutely not because I don't like the food but when I've had a choice between say Malaysia and Bali you know like those when it's come down to like random choices yeah. between things like that I've chosen Malaysia because of the food yeah whereas Bali you know I know that you get like a lot of western food there because right. it is quite westernized of course the indigenous food is that makes sense as well. I mean I want to go to Vietnam because of the food I've the never food been yeah oh, just, I, whenever anyone goes I just stalk them on like Instagram and go oh we want that and they want that all those want things that. wrapped in banana leaves that's oh, what I really love and the fish and just the, and the herbs and all the herbs, herbs all. yeah the lemongrass and so yeah one of my favourite town in the world is, is in Vietnam yeah uh, oh, oh, I've forgotten the name of it now <laughs> It's um, Hoi An. Oh, yes. Yeah. I read a, a foodie guide to Hoi An the other day. Oh, and I was Hoi like, An is just the most amazing, beautiful place. It's just a it's 16th century Chinese fishing village and it's covered in lanterns oh. and tiny. It's like a, the Disney-fied Asian village, <laughs> you know. You can see that Disney Asian village and it's just so, it's just stunning. Again, wind chimes. I keep going on about wind chimes. I don't, I don't, I don't never talk about wind chimes. I don't even have any wind chimes at home, but I seem to have developed an obsession I've got a couple. for wind chimes. Well, I, I'm, I think I'm, everything's pointing to me to buy some wind chimes. And the food, like you said, is amazing. Yeah. Really amazing. And of course, they have that French heritage as well. Yes. So you get a lot of baguettes and things. Yeah, yeah, really exactly. Nice people selling baguettes on the, uh, on the street Very corners. Very good bread. So. <laughs> have you got any trips planned at all? No, no, not, not in the near future. I'm going to Ireland next summer with my in-laws because my my mother-in-law's family are from there. Um, and we're going to Burma next Christmas. But other than that, I might, might be going to Edinburgh this, this Christmas. Can't beat a bit of Edinburgh. Bit, Can't beat a bit, bit cold. Bit. But uh, yeah. before, we, uh, before I ask you my last question, I've got to ask you about the cookbook, uh-huh. which is absolutely stunning. And I am... I am the sort of person who burns a pot noodle. I have literally <laughs> set fire to a kitchen three times while trying to boil a kettle to make tea. And I'm not lying. This has actually happened. Do the salads. Uh, yeah, do the salads. I There's a whole section salads. of salads. I'm, I'm, I'm obsessed with salads. If I had to choose, if I was on death row, which hopefully I won't be, if I had to choose a last meal, it'd be, I really love salads. There you like go. Different types of salads. There, there was I a whole chat. Just because I don't, I don't cook doesn't mean I don't know a lot about food. I do know a lot yeah. about food and I love food. And this looks absolutely gorgeous. So I'm going to have to um, tell someone to make recipes from this for me. But tell, tell me about the book. How did it come about? What's in it? Okay, so the book is kind of a... a it's almost like a, a diary, I suppose. So, you know, I said I've been going to Burma since I was eight. So you'll see from the introductions, <laughs> I talk a lot about how I came across the dish the first time I ate it. And, you know, I try to put everything in context. And then, like, the introduction itself is... Longer than your average cookbook, I believe. A lot of people have mentioned, is this your memoir? Um, and I guess it's kind of going down that route. But, but basically, there's a lot of photos in there. But it, it, it's kind of my, it's, it's sort of memories, but it's also kind of now. Because what I, I didn't want it to just be a nostalgia trip. So what it is, is kind of food that you can get there now. If you go into a restaurant and you ask for this dish and you point at it, you should be able to find it. And the one thing I did, because I'm aware that people often buy books and they never cook anything from it. So I've added a pronunciation guide at the back and I've also written all of the names in Burmese. 
So, you know, if you want to photocopy it, go to Burma and say, can I have this? Take it with you. <laughs> can, uh, you can order it. What's but, been your most memorable meal? Well, in Burma? Yeah. Probably the one at my wedding. So that was, uh, it's called Dumbao, and it's basically like a, a pilaf. And it's like your big celebratory things, just like rice and chicken and all lovely kind of cloves and spices and all that kind of thing and then you have all these lovely side dishes and basically you just lay it in front of you like a banquet and yeah no that that, that makes me think of family and celebration but also you know my wedding so <laughs> so you got married in Burma I went to weddings so I had one here and one there as oh, well so. I'm really gutted that I wasn't invited to your wedding <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I know, if you have another one, I'm sure you won't. <laughs> I can renew my vows. It's 15 renew years vows. now, so... <laughs> can I come along and eat? Because that sounds amazing. What's the most standout recipe in this book, do you think? The standout one? Do you know what? The, pe- the one that people comment on a lot, actually, is the tofu. Because Burmese tofu is, is not like any other tofu. We don't use soybeans. We use chickpeas or split peas or both. And so it's kind of, you know, the base ingredient is not the same. And then the way we eat it and the way we prepare it, it's kind of, it's just a lot more interesting and sexy, for want of a better word, than, than sexy your standard tofu. tofu. Sexy oh my tofu. God. <laughs> well, I'm, as, as a non meat eater, I do consume ah. some tofu. I don't know if I've ever, ever had any sexy tofu, so I'm going to be looking forward to that. Is there a restaurant you'd recommend? Because if I don't try any recipes, there are a couple actually. So um, there's one called La Pep, which is the Burmese word for pickled tea, because that's probably your most weird and famous ingredient and um, that's in Shoreditch and um, that is lovely that is kind of they they kind of specialize more in the kind of food that I eat because the chef is from the same place that my mum's from um, which is Mogo which is in the hills in, in Burma um, and the restaurant itself is beautiful and you can go and they do really good cocktails as well oh, so great I actually had my book launched there so Did you? is yeah. it what sort of a night out is it is it like a couples night out could I take the tickets in the daytime should I just go yeah, with the girls and cocktails they've got really nice booths so you can take children in the daytime because they do lunches as well so yeah definitely take the kids as well but at night it's somewhere where you can just kind of have a really nice relaxed time and they have like Mandalay beer and Mandalay rum as well so you, you've got stuff from the homeland there to drink so that that's kind of my date night type place and then there's another restaurant which has been around for decades actually which is in Kilburn and that's called Mandalay Golden Myanmar and they're very much kind of old school traditional they're the places that you go when you're missing your mum's home cooking so it's not it's not like so Le Pet is kind of more kind of snacky but also like noodles and all sorts of things that you eat when you're feeling like you want to have fun and a really delicious meal um, Mandalay is some way that you go because you just want to be looked after so yeah oh my god I'm starving now I'm sure everyone <laughs> else is listening to that and it is a beautiful book how can we buy it anywhere everywhere it's available internationally as well actually it was released in uh, Australia in July and in America last month but yeah it is available from all good bookshops and it's called Mandalay Recipes and Tales from a Burmese Kitchen by Mimi A. 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 Yeah. By Mimi A. <laughs> A-Y-E. Wonderful. Thank you. Oh, the last question, actually. Ah. <laughs> and actually, do you know what? In, when you mentioned karaoke, I was going to ask you what your karaoke song is, but these, these might be two different <laughs> answers. Okay, so first, uh, no, I'm going to ask you the music question first. Okay. And then it might not be your karaoke song, but I'm, I might ask you what that <laughs> is as well. So my last question is always about music because I always think that music and travel go hand in hand okay. for a lot of people. If you had to choose one song that reminds you of a special or memorable time of travel, what would that song be? So... <laughs> oh, you know, it's straight away. I do. It's really cheesy, though. So it's basically, it's Blaze of Glory by Bon Jovi. Oh, my God. You can't um, go wrong with a bit of John. The reason, though, this is kind of quite weird. I, I, I associate it with sitting outside my grandparents' house in Mandalay. As one and, does. As one, as one does. And these three kids on motorbikes, they must have been teenagers, just blasted past me singing it as loud as they could. And I just remember thinking, this is quite cool. <laughs> so, yeah, just... Children screaming Bon Jovi songs whilst, you know, motorbiking past me. That, that is probably my travel song. And so now, like, when I'm driving, I, I like to blast a bit of Bon Jovi, <laughs> even though I don't normally listen to it. I just associate it with sun and fun, basically. There's so. absolutely nothing wrong with blasting out a bit of Bon Jovi. <laughs> and what is your karaoke, your favourite karaoke number to do in Japan? <laughs> do you know what? It's, it's, you 
you ought to know by Alanis Morissette. Oh, yeah. Just because you can shout it so It's quite high, though, isn't it? Oh, I like that, Do though. you? Do you like the high? I, I like don't know. That. I mean, I, I love a bit of Alanis and... That, that album, you know, really appealed to me as a teenager, you know, a teenage full of female teenage angst. And but you know what? I great found, album. I found out recently that she's only a little bit older than me, which means that when she was famous, she must have been really young. Yeah, so she was, yeah. A lot of those no songs idea. were written when she was in her late teens. She's older than me as well, but she was in her late teens when she wrote them yeah. and she'd been wronged by some older guy. Right. But I don't think... I mean, I'm, I'm recalling this now. I'm not going to look it up. I don't think she ever named him I ah. think that was it but it was a lot of like you know anger <laughs> and female like teenage hormones and I could, yes. I really we would shout that out in bars oh yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. And you're one. still shouting that out in bars still shouting out there I love it I think I have tried <laughs> to do that at karaoke but found that especially at four o'clock in the morning which is when I tend to do my karaoke my voice <laughs> by that point is just a little bit huskier well, the thing that is, I would like when you choose a song like that everyone sings with you so you know it's actually quite nice because you don't necessarily you know you can be forgiven any sins so. I'm singing along in my head right now thank you so much for coming on the Big Travel Podcast thank you for having me <laughs> Thank you so much, Mimi, for being such a delightful guest and to you for listening to the Big Travel Podcast. Next week, join me for a random drive around Oxford with the comedian and travel obsessive Dom Jolly. See you then. For a couple of decades after the First World War, something mysterious happened. There were murders in country houses, in vicarages, in far-flung parts of the globe and quaint English villages. No fictional character was safe. People couldn't get enough of murder mysteries by writers like Agatha Christie, Dorothy L. Sayers and more, but their success has obscured the fascinating stories that lie behind the plots. And that's what you can find on my podcast, She Done It. I tell the stories that lurk in the shadows of the great detective novels. Find us in all major podcast apps.